Hey, thank you. Thank you for being here this morning to learn about how we as a support team at Rackspace take care of over 100 private cloud customers every day. I'm um, going to give you, there's four of us talking today. Uh, behind me is Darren. He was born and raised in San Diego by a pack of wolves. He's busy raising his kids now up in Dallas-Fort Worth with the same pack of wolves. And he's the second shift guy on Rackspace, uh, private cloud engineering support team to solve all of your cloud problems. I am Mark Deverter. I've been at Rackspace for a little over five years. The one thing I've really learned with uh, Rackspace is kind of grab your and get ready for what's coming next, because sometimes it's not a smooth ride. The big guy over here is Chris Woodard, and he's here just to prove that somebody, even somebody with a Louisiana School of Public Education can work in OpenStack. Berto behind me hails from North Austin. Um, his full name is Riber Alberto Rivera Laporte, and North Austin is where people with names of that complexity come from. He lives with his wife, Diana. He's got two dogs, Leo and Ryder, and the cat, Daisley. He, Daisy. He didn't give me a picture of the cat. This is sort of internet stuff. He failed for not giving me a picture of a cat. Anyway, to move on, I'm going to hand it over to Berto, and he's going to talk to you about OpenStack support one year later. Hey, greeting, guys. Uh, so what Mark actually failed to tell you guys is at the end of the conference, well, at the end of this presentation, there's going to be a real nice cat waiting for you out there. So congratulations. All you guys are going to be cat parents. Um, I wanted to ask everybody a question here. Uh, how many of you are OpenStack operators in the room? Oh, man, this is sweet. OK, how many of you are actually new to OpenStack in general, have very little experience or haven't worked on it before? OK, fantastic. This presentation is for you guys. So um, this month actually marks my first year where I've been uh, working in an open, uh, or supporting OpenStack at a professional capacity. For, so I survived my first year. It has been really interesting and very exciting. And I'm happy to share a lot of my perspective as to what goes into supporting this type of environment. So when I started learning, or when I started working with OpenStack, this is my perception of what the average uh, environment would look like, right? We, uh, very simple, uh, but that, you know, it's not always the case, right? It does, that diagram that you see here does a good job into uh, giving you an overall perspective of what uh, OpenStack environment looks like, but it's not when you actually start digging into it, then you start un uncovering the fun stuff. And, you know, seeing that for the first time, you know, my mind just went absolutely blank. So it's, uh, this, this is what resembles a logical architecture in an OpenStack environment. Uh, keep in mind that does not take into consideration any of your routing, switching, or host, or any of your physical uh, layout. So it does do a good job as well to tell you about the complexity that we're involved in working with on a day-to-day -day basis. So to the eyes of them, you know, a guy that just started doing this as a novice, you just feel like you've just been entirely just trolled by OpenStack. So, but it's like that with any type of technology, right? Uh, it seems a little bit insurmountable at first to be able to be very intimately familiar with a lot of the, these technologies, especially as a new guy. But like everything, it just, you know, takes time and patience and, uh, and determination, and then you should be able to, you know, get a decent idea of what it is even after a year later, so. Uh, now, let's, let's explore some of the differences or on traditional support, uh, Linux support, and then we'll, what you do as an OpenStack administrator for those that have never supported OpenStack before. And a lot of this right here that I'm going to be presenting next, it's very subjective to the size of your organization, right? They are small shops or small organizations where you see the Linux team pretty much handling everything that you see there and more, uh, where there's uh, also, you know, large organizations where there are multiple Linux teams which are focused on different disciplines. Uh, so that, that just, you know, wanted to just point out that difference there. Now, as far as how different this is in comparison to what you do as an open sec, it's really not a whole lot changes. You just get to wear a lot of different hats at the same time. So you get to do everything that you see there in a traditional Linux support environment. And, uh, you know, you might be exposed to a lot of different technologies that some of you may or may not have any experience working with. I mentioned containers there just because as a, as a Rackspace support engineer, we utilize OpenStack Ansible as the uh, deployment method for our OpenStack deployments, which uses that technology as well as um, containers. And it, and, sorry, 
yep, we use the, uh, those two you know, technologies to deliver the installation and maintenance and uh, upgrades of the, of the different uh, planes. Um, network or networking configurations uh, are still one of the very op challenges of understanding uh, OpenStack um, as far as the deployment methods, right? It uses a lot of different technologies that a lot of the times I haven't seen. Uh, I've been doing Linux for close to 10 years now, and it wasn't until I started working with OpenStack where I had to learn about uh, Linux network namespaces, right? I was like, you know, my mind was entirely blown by the concept at first because you typically don't see it on a day-to-day -day environment. Uh, and then you have to deal with stuff with, uh, you know, Linux bridges, open vSwitch if your neutral model supports it, and same thing with IP tables. There's lots and lots of ITP tables uh, that you have to familiarize yourself with. Uh, in addition to all of the challenges that you're seeing to having to figure out the physical components and all the other infrastructure, you also then have to worry about, not worry, but you have to be responsible for supporting uh, the, all of the different components. And I point back to the logical diagram that we were looking at. We have to dig very deep into a lot of these uh, Python messages or stack traces and identifying, you know, what is a normal condition? I mean, is this what it's supposed to be doing? Or, is, you know, is, is this a bug? And given the uh, inner dependencies amongst all the services, a lot of the errors are very obvious, but a lot of them require a lot of dig digging. But like everything, you know, with some patience and determination, you're re rewarded with a greater understanding of the you know, whole picture. And even a year later, I still have a picture still almost there, but no, it's, it's, it's great. Um, in, in, in addition to this, you know, you have to also educate and help your consumers of the cloud, meaning your tenants, your projects, your users, with all levels of, uh, you know, with all levels of uh, difficulties of experiences on those users, in addition to dealing with your day-to-day -day traditional system operation, you know, responsibilities, uh, break fixes, continuous improvement, uh, infrastructure lifecycle, backup security, and all that stuff. Um, now, some of the useful strategies to me as a new OpenStacker, uh, things that I've discovered along the way that have helped me uh, understand this uh, is to divide and conquer, right? Everybody hears the term divide and conquer. is dividing all of the different components into what they call planes. And you're gonna be hearing all these terms throughout the conference. You're gonna be hearing control plane, network plane, maybe computer or storage plane, is identifying all those different components and the level of criticality, right? So the control plane, uh, which consists of all of the services that are shared among all of the OpenStack services is what I think is you know, one of the most critical, right? So having a great understanding of how this uh, you know, perform and how well they scale is very critical to any OpenStack infrastructure. Followed, which I can't believe I put it, I didn't put it here right underneath the control plane is uh, authentication plane, your keystones. You have to understand, because that's a service that is dependent across the, you know, all of the other projects utilize it. So it's good to have a great understanding of what that, you know, what that entails and how to troubleshoot it and so on to get a better idea of what the entire picture. Uh, if you are a new user or someone that's still a little bit, uh, you know, on the fence or still looking to explore a little bit more, you know, start small. There's, um, you know, even within a year from now, there's still been a great changes on the number of all-in-one distributions that are out there that you can use to familiarize yourself with the different projects. And, you know, if you were like me that were intimidated by that crazy spaghetti diagram that we see at first, uh, it's really rare to see all the projects implemented at the same time. I mean, so that's, you know, one thing. And with that in mind, you know, taking time to explore your, your core projects, right? Your Keystone, Nova, Neutron, Cinder, Glance, and Swift. Um, and join the different mailing lists that we have. Uh, their IRC channels, uh, your OpenStack meetups. I mean, I'm, I'm it's crazy. I, I, I'm blessed here that here in Austin, we have a really big OpenStack presence, and there's a lot of meetups that happens on a, you know, on a monthly basis. And, because of my schedule, I'm not able to attend them all, but man, you know, it's, it's great. It's a rich resource to have to interact with other OpenStack users. And of course, you know, events like here, like the summit. Um, you know, that's uh, pretty much for me for this morning. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it to Darren Carpenter here. How you doing, everyone? Um, I'm gonna be talking to you all a little about public cloud or private cloud, what's different, what I've seen. Um, still kind of a high level overview, but uh, let's get going. Uh, so things changed quite a bit when I went from supporting private clouds to supporting public clouds. Um, regardless of 
which cloud you're supporting, one key thing is always, you know, stands in the forefront of my mind, is that I'm here to serve. I don't want customers using uh, services that they're unfamiliar with or uh, making simple mistakes that I could easily help them avoid. In the public cloud, imagine each support team being compartmentalized from a, you know, a support aspect. Everyone tends to have a specialty or focus that they're assigned, and your success is measured on how deep your understanding is in that focus and how that translates to a happy customer. Um, we had folks specifically working with Nova, others with Cinder, others you know, tailoring images for consumption and so on. In the private cloud, just imagine being thrown into a canyon, left to fend for yourself, wearing a tunic and wielding a crudely made spear. Uh, the environment around you changes every six months, so the little shelter that you built to get you guys out of the environment uh, needs to be constantly in a state of growth. Uh, with that in mind, from the viewpoint of a support manager, uh, the type of folks that you bring into your fold needs is a very important decision. It, not that it ever is an important decision. Uh, it's just that you have to consider that not every great thinker is a great adapter. I realized shortly after transitioning to a private cloud role that attempting to sit pretty as a master of one or two things simply was not going to be acceptable. Uh, supporting a private cloud is like being a Swiss army knife where every tool that you have at your disposal is constantly being used to the point of going dull. Uh, with that, the requirement to constantly sharpen your skills becomes paramount in the future success that you're going to achieve. Outside of simply having a support team uh, where members of the unit come from various backgrounds and have various levels of familiarity. It's benefited us to have a small team of folks dedicated to research and development of a training regimen. Uh, these folks could be chosen simply due to their tenure, uh, but in my opinion, it works better to find folks with a training background and melding those two groups together. Just had the best results with that. Not to say in the public cloud that you should not also receive training, but from what I've noticed in more generalized roles, uh, the will and desire of the individual determine you know, how much training they're going to pursue. Whereas in the private cloud, uh, it needs to be part of the actual job description to receive frequent training on new and upcoming technologies. Working on the public side, I've run into a very wide range of customers. These customers can be mom and pop startups, small development groups testing something out, a variety of other types. The other end of the spectrum can be large companies that simply don't want to invest in the hardware and expertise required to operate things privately. What I've noticed, the trend with these large companies in the public realm is that they're testing the waters to see if this is indeed something that they wanted to do. Uh, the problem I saw with that was the fact that resources on these hosts are shared and environments created tend to be deployed similar to that of a dedicated offering in that redundancy and recreatability are sometimes limited and this sometimes left them with a bad impression. Let me stop there to make a very important point in my mind. Regardless of the route you choose, public or private, the architecture of your deployment needs to utilize the strength of the cloud. The, that strength, in my opinion, is the ability to deploy quickly uh, without the overhead and delays encountered in procuring and bootstrapping those new resources. Far too many times in the public cloud, I had customers run into issues where they took their dedicated mindset of a single machine or set of machines that must stay up. What I found in all these environments is the data, of course, needed to be accessible, but it wasn't placed on a medium that could easily be transferred to another host in the case of a down event. Ideally, recovering from a down event in the cloud should be as simple as bringing up a new host to be a configuration management, potentially even automated against uh, a monitoring failure and associating the required data to that host. Afterwards, you pull the problematic device out of the equation, and then once the swap is complete, throw it away. If you were using Rackspace's public cloud, this would typically involve cloud load balancer in front of the respective service with various nodes behind it. Um, RCAs would be limited to repeat issues with hosts of similar type, saving time and effort from your staff at the end of race, but requiring a little bit more preparation on the front end. Now please understand, uh, my experiences do not define every workload or data set. This is just kind of what I've run into uh, in my time amongst the clouds. On the private side, the customers begin to look a little bit more simpler, similar. They're typically larger, have a legacy dedicated environment they're attempting to shift onto their cloud platform. Uh, these companies typically have a little bit more experience with cloud, though they haven't necessarily graduated from some of the mistakes they made in the public cloud. One key thing that they do understand is that owning the entire cloud presents some new problems, 
but it prevents other people's problems from becoming issues that they have to solve for within their deployment. Supporting the public cloud revolved more around the knowledge of the APIs and the ecosystem that was built around the environment. Uh, the compartment type support was kind of the norm once I moved into an operations role, since the environment gets so large at that point that it's no longer feasible to have a single individual or a group of individuals supporting it. Specialist-minded folks seemed to thrive here as they could pick a particular project they were interested in and dig deep. Personally, I've always been more of a jack of all trades, which is why I feel very comfortable working in a private cloud support role. Rarely, if at all, as far as I can remember, did I touch Keystone in the public cloud. Whereas in the private cloud, manipulation of users and tenants is rather commonplace. Upgrades definitely become more of a job in the private cloud. With the frequency of releases, you're typically in discussion with one or another customer about the version of OpenStack they're running and how they can get up to the new latest, the greatest, uh, with all the fancy bells and whistles. With that in mind, it would benefit you to have a drafted plan in place for environment upgrades and how your instances will be handled during these events. You can just shut all the instances down at once. You want to shut them down per compute. You want to restart instances in a particular order. Maybe migrate the instances to available hosts. That would probably be the preferred, in my opinion. Um, another benefit of private clouds is that they provide you with greater flexibility in terms of what modules are utilized. For example, if you want to use Neutron with OVS, Neutron with Linux Bridge, versus in the public cloud, you're pretty much stuck with whatever the vendors decided is going to work best for them in their environment. Multi-region deployments are another thing that need to be considered as many companies have environments, locations, and customers scattered across the world. From the public cloud standpoint, when dealing with a relatively larger provider, it's much easier to get a married environment in multiple locations as part of their selling point is going to be where they already have a presence. Contrasting that against the private cloud, this would typically be limited to where your company itself has a presence, assuming you were going to host it in your own data center. Uh, if you were using a cloud provider, you could, of course, utilize their data centers. Public cloud, in my opinion, gives you greater agility in this area, simply because the hardware is already in place. It just becomes a matter of determining what is needed, spinning it up, running some configuration management against it, and then send it out in the wild. Whereas in the private cloud, you may need to order the hardware, get your initial kick, add it to the environment, boot your instances, run configuration management, and so on. Another thing I noticed is there seems to be like a lack of a deep talent pool when it comes to cloud computing, both for the public cloud and the private cloud. The benefit the public cloud has is it's usually a solid system administrator can pick up the nuances of supporting a public cloud environment relatively quickly. While in the private cloud, they'll need to get their feet a little bit more wet just because you have a tendency to deal with quite a bit more variety on a daily basis. But with that in mind, utilizing the expertise of cloud providers and their support teams becomes beneficial to organizations that don't want to hire new staff or invest heavily into training their current staff in cloud concepts. One thing I can definitely say that benefits the public and private cloud, uh, consumers rather, is to lean heavily on configuration management. And if you're an administrator, it would behoove you to become familiar with one or more of the configuration management tools. Uh, if you're logging into every separate host whenever a piece of your application stack goes down, in, in my opinion, you're doing it wrong. In the public cloud, security, security and privacy are a slightly bigger issue, considering, again, that your instances are running on shared resources. I would suggest that you pay close attention to the news regarding the hypervisor and tools being utilized by your provider, um, along with, obviously, keeping up to date with the same thing for your application stack. The last piece of advice I'd like to leave you with is regardless of which type of cloud you're using, public or private, ensure your environment is mirrored in at least two different data centers because you never know when some poor man is going in his pickup truck is going to plow into an electric box outside of the data center where your data is hosted and cause a hard down event. Um, that's all I got for you guys today. Uh, my colleague, Mr. Diverter, behind me is going to be speaking to you all a little bit about escalations. Thanks, Darren. So we all want our clouds to work, and they should work because they're redundant, right? We've got hypervisors everywhere. We have control planes that are multi, multifaceted. But why do we have so many escalations? And it does happen. Escalations come up with us almost on a daily basis at Rackspace. In my experience, it's always rabbit. Something else could fail, but that's going to take Rabbit down. Rabbit doesn't like disruptive network traffic. 
it starts to partition, it'll lose your queues, you're gonna end up with backed up queues, like neutron workers. It's really a bad situation. You really have to care for rabbit. That's your, that's your pet. You, you really have to pet your rabbit. Look at this. The same diagram that Alberto showed you, over there in the center, bottom sort of center left, that's rabbit in the middle of all these API queues. Every API goes through, a message goes through rabbit. Now, if you're talking about large neutron heat builds, that's a hundred, I mean, that's, neutron workers go out of their minds because there's so many requests coming in for port workers, but I'm gonna get to that in a minute. Here's the easy thing to do. In the rabbit documentation, take a look at the link. You can also pull this down from our slide share but go to that link and Rabbit says the default is 30 IR, 30 Erlang IO thread workers, but they recommend 128. In the OSIC cluster, which a thousand nodes, but I was working with about 512 of those servers building 800 instances. It took me about 17 minutes without changing anything to build 800 servers with about a 25% failure rate. Most of those were due to neutron failures and some keystone stuff, but that was also related to uh, neutron. I'll get to that in just a moment. So look at your IO workers. This could be in an uh, all-in-one deployment. This could be in your, you know, however big your private cloud is. You gotta care for your rabbit, bring those threads up so everything can work properly together. Um, when you're seeing some failures in Rabbit, here's a simple script. Again, you can pull this down from our slide share. Uh, this will pull any uh, queue or message out of a queue that you want if you have the username and password. It'll pull the queue, let you, or message, let you look at it, and then re-inject it so it can be processed properly. But it gives you an idea what your Rabbit is doing at this point. So what are the other issues? Well. Heat, heat builds. Um, see this a lot with our customers uh, that are bursting up and bursting down. You know, in, my, in every four hours, they might bring up a few hundred instances. They'll tear them back down. Another hour, they're bringing them back up. Well, those are overrunning your message Erlang queues. But your Neutron workers really suffer. The default here, I think in the Neutron.conf, is 16 workers. If you're bursting that big, you've got to really increase those, those neutron workers. I brought them up to 128 in our OSIC environment. I didn't see any detriment to load, so seems pretty safe to me. Um, but without increasing that, if I monitored the neutron queues in Rabbit, the neutron queues were bursting to 7,000 messages. That's all these compute hosts requesting ports, ports trying to get sent back, all of this going through Rabbit, all of this having to go through Keystone, and that's the other part, your Keystone workers. Once Neutron starts bursting, Neutron's gonna start giving you authentication failures, too many connections, I won't do it anymore. So look at your Keystone workers. You have to gauge that against your environment, but this is how you start preventing your end users from coming to you and saying, why is everything failing when I try to do my heat build? So put your focus in your infrastructure. These are your, if it's an AIO, if it's, you know, at Rackspace, our, our builds are in quorum. So we have to have three, five, seven, that keeps Galera happy, that keeps Rabbit happy, uh, of amount of infrastructure nodes. But look at what you're gonna have to do. Look at your uh, CPU power, look at your RAM power, and gauge your infrastructure accordingly. That keeps down your escalations. Other stuff, Neutron. All of this is networking, whether it's VXLAN, whether it's VLAN, or GRE, it's all networking at the bottom end. I'm gonna throw a shameless plug in right here for my friend James Denton. Buy this book, <laughs> Learning OpenStack Networking. Uh, this, uh, the second edition just came out, but this you should know back and forth if you're a senior engineer on your support team, or expect your support teams to know what they're doing with Neutron. You have to know it. This is the best book there is. There's a new one that just came out, Essential Neutron. Um, it's a little bit lighter, it's more topical, it'd be good for your junior admins to learn, but you have to know Neutron because if your routers start failing, your instances go offline, they don't have IP addresses anymore, how are you gonna troubleshoot that? By the way, he'll be selling the book uh, tomorrow, 
We missed it today. It was earlier this morning. And what? What's free? The book is free? Oh, okay. The book is free. Uh, tomorrow you can get that at the Rackspace Cantina at 3 o'clock. What else? Um, our move to Maria DB and Galera over MySQL. Um, master slave replication, master master replication. It had been a problem for us at Rackspace. We moved to Maria DB with Galera. I haven't seen maybe but one replication failure with Galera doing all the work. And when it failed, you just restarted Galera. It's an amazing product. So that was another big point of escalations were replication failures. It was a great move for us. Uh, I recommend it for your private clouds. Go with that. And with that, I'm going to give it over to Chris Woodard. Thanks, Mark. OK, so you've heard about you know, one year later being in OpenStack support, uh, coming from public cloud to private cloud, and then escalation. So I'm going to do a very, very high level overview of kind of you know, what is architecture and how we design for customer-specific needs. So architecture comes from a Greek root to build or to create. Um, and remember, we're doing like a really high level overview here. So if you know, internet's information superhighway, like architecture is the road, we would be the civil engineers. Um, so typically, what people are thinking about um, when they're talking about architecture, they're, they're thinking about a product. So it would be some sort of reference architecture. And really, that's just like a set of standards for your product. Um, and so RPC is Rackspace Private Cloud. Um, this is the reference architecture for, um, started this in Icehouse. Um, you're going to hear a lot of the same themes here. Uh, you know, some of these guys were kind of covering some of this before. So I don't know who sort of ran our earlier deployments. So like Havana, we did a chef-based deployment. We had two controller nodes, uh, used HA proxy, OVS. Uh, we're doing active-active replication. So a lot of the things that we learned um, and some of the pain points that we experienced there, we rolled that into Icehouse, and we made some design, de design decisions um, for to have a production-ready cloud. So uh, we went with containers for a seamless upgrade. Uh, we did Linux Bridge because we experienced issues with OVS. Um, we took well, and you know this has been this template's been changing as we've learned other things like uh, you know Cinder is now on bare metal, um, and then we have like a dedicated logging server. And as we add additional projects or features, you know, these uh, like the little asterisks on storage will continue to grow as we support additional items. Um, but, you know, essentially you have your compute uh, logging in your infrastructure. And those are your core components that we can just add on to this. And, you know, as we grow to regions or anything else, this will adapt and, and grow for that. So what really, like, learning what the customer needs or how we design for that is asking the right questions, you know. Who are you? What do you do? Um, who's your customer? What do they do? And, you know, what does your workload look like? Is it bursty? Is it sustained? Do you have high I.O.? What are, you know, what are you doing there? And, you know, what is your environment? Um, you guys doing straight L2? Are you doing L3? Do you have a ton of neutron routers? Uh, they're using floating IPs. Um, do you have multi-region? Are we looking at a DR solution here? I mean, and um, then also we kind of talk about your roadmap. What is your immediate goals, long term? What's on fire? You know, what can we immediately do to make your life better? And so we'll take that information and we kind of process it. You know, um, what, can, what will benefit you? Um, what will give you the most quality of life? So you're doing a lot of one-to-one -one virtualization or you, um, you're, you know, you're doing bare metal or um, like you're spinning up a lot of Hadoop nodes. How about we try to do ironic or, um, you know, spin that. Like the cloud's are really about consolidation. And so you're just bringing all these things together. And so we're trying to make your life easier. And, you know, possibly, does it make sense to bring a product in early for you? You know, is it, you know, is it production ready? Are you going to be, you're going to have a lot of, you know, are you going to have a bad day with this, moving to this product? 
So really the end fun portion of the job is like really setting expectations. So, you know, we talk about the KISS method, um, you know, keeping it simple. So you got this million dollar SAN that goes down twice a year versus some compute nodes which just spinning disks that are up for three years. You know, um, what makes sense there? So if you're um, every summit, people are trying to change design direction, you know, new hotness might be lukewarm. You know, you never know. Uh, and supportable and repeatable, you know, 3 a.m. calls happen. You don't want this to be a snowflake that only you know about. You know, they talk about being the hero. You don't want to be the hero every Saturday. So have it so everyone on your team can support it. Um, solid, you know, solid plan. Uh, also, <laughs> don't, you know, you don't want to test in prod. You need people, this is kind of the same theme there. Um, you don't want to be the only person who knows about this. So, and also you don't want to be looking things up as you're troubleshooting. And I think I talked a little fast. <laughs> and really kind of wrapping it up is, um, we want to take a base template, receive our customer input, um, build the solution, you know, enable features, and really just plan for tomorrow. How, how are we going to grow this? And I think, and so our plug is, uh, you know, go check out the Rackspace Cantina. And questions. I have one. Yeah, go ahead. So I know that Mark earlier was explaining about the, it took him about 17 minutes, right, to build uh, a bunch of uh, instances on uh, 500 compute hosts and then with about a 25% failure rate but you never heard back as to how long did it, you know, after making the neutral modifications and, and the API workers and so on, you know, did that make a difference in your build success rates as well as the uh, overall speed of the deploy? Thanks for bringing that up because I never looked at my cards once and that was in there. <laughs> so yeah, it took 17 minutes before any of the tuning to build about 800 instances with about a 25% failure rate. After making the tunings to the Erlang workers, bring up my Neutron API workers and the Keystone workers, I was building 800 instances in four and a half minutes, somewhere around there, it was, uh, it was four and a half to five minutes, just depending on each individual build with zero failures. All out, everything going status active, I could ping everything over their script with no issues. Quick question related to that. Yes. Well, uh, so it started off with tracking rabbit logs and looking in rabbit and seeing connect AMP, AMPQ connections failing, going to specific compute hosts where there were failed uh, you know, er instances that went to error state and looking in novacompute.log and seeing what was the basic failure and it was AMPQ. So I went back to AMPQ and started looking at the documentation and said, let me bring those workers up. So I brought the workers up. Now, I lost when I did my next builds. I was losing the AMPQ connection errors. Those were gone, but I was still having failed builds. Now, when I dug, digger, or dug deeper, I saw that they were really related to Neutron issues. So Neutron was just timing out. Um, dug into Neutron and found out that I just don't have enough API workers to deal with all these port requests going back and forth. So I brought that up. That reduced it now down to about a 12% failure rate. Um, at that point, I was a little bit at a loss, but I just started looking through my infrastructure. I went to Keystone, looked at my Keystone logs eventually, and found too many connections. I didn't have enough pull workers, and they were timing out. So I brought my Keystone pull workers up. I increased my time out to 30 seconds, and at that point, it all cleared up. It was really just Linux troubleshooting. We have it into uh, the uh, OpenStack product, our RPC product. It's published into there. Um, I do need to put it out to the public. I'm just trying to find the right avenue to put it there. I was just curious, do you guys hang out like in IRC at all? Yeah, uh, I'm on Freenode. Um, my last name is Diverter, but if you spell it backwards, it's Reved. You can get me at Reved anytime in IRC on Freenode. Cool. Yep. And I'll give you a business card if you want one. 
Absolutely. Thank you for your questions. Anything else? <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Tell, tell me to what extent you agree or disagree with the statement. Okay. When you're on the well-worn path, OpenStack is great. Take two steps off that well-worn path and you're in for a world of hurt. Mm -hmm. And to give you some context, at NVIDIA we're doing game streaming. So we want to virtualize the GPU. Mm -hmm. We want to run on Citrix Zen because that's where vGPU works the best. We want super low latency networking because latency is king when you're streaming your game. Um, and we also want high performance disk because loading textures is very IO intensive. We've barely gotten this working on AWS, and so I'm wondering, are we in for a world of pain when, if we think about OpenStack? So with OpenStack, um, in our reference architecture, everything on the uh, compute plane is, or the instance plane is running at 10G. So we try to take away the network latency there. Uh, we have one customer that we're working with right now on installing actual GPUs and bringing those in through um, KVM hypervisor to do the rendering inside of an instance. There's a limitation there. You can only import one GPU to a single instance. So KVM is extremely limited there. I haven't worked in Zen for a number of years, so I can't answer to the, qu that, the point that you brought up right now. Um, but... But in general, so vGPU yeah. sounds like there's no support at all. It's, it's only pass-through. It's pass-through. We've tried Zen off with the latest OpenStack, and it mm -hmm. just flat out has bugs. Right. And Citrix acknowledges this, and they want to work to fix them. Okay. So, so right there, there are two things. We're in the weeds already. And I worry that there's just, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And so, for example, we recycle our VMs every 15 minutes. So okay. someone plays a game, we kill the VM, we recreate it to reinit the state. I like that. That sort of thing is a big deal if the duty cycle, if it takes 10 minutes to get the VM back up, you know, you're only at 50% utilization. So I'm worried that there's going to be those sorts of gotchas that we're going to run into if we go down this road. Well, honestly, there probably are gotchas that I don't even know about at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, because these are things that I just haven't worked with with our particular customers. Um, these are the rendering aspect, that's something that we're just starting with with one of our customers. Um, they're going to be bringing GPUs into their environment very soon. Uh, that's something that I've been tasked with working on them with. So once I, I don't know, work on that, look into it, maybe I can publish something on it, bring a little bit of enlightenment, but um, it is OpenStack. I mean, as far as virtualization, bringing up VMs, running things, you know, very, very cloudy, you know, this is probably the number one, this is the number one product for it. For some of the really specific use cases, um, I don't know if We're management is wants saying. me to say <laughs> this, but, but it's, yeah, trial, trial, and, trial and learn. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah. Let me check our time. Yeah, hello, yeah, we're out. So, okay. I was just going to ask, from a staffing perspective, uh, one of you mentioned that jack of all trades is your more or less approach, but Darren. in coming into like a legacy enterprise IT shop, is it more common that you've seen where they try to take somebody that's working on a legacy component like networking or storage and try to bring them uh, and map them over to that component inside of OpenStack, or is it more common to have somebody be the jack of all trades and try to address whatever project is being used, in, uh, being used under the OpenStack project. Thanks. So from what I've noticed is it, there's kind of a mixture of both. Um, if that individual doesn't want to stray from what they're used to, then pushing them into that role works. Um, if you have the staffing, you know, obviously you can put more people into specialized positions versus if you have smaller teams, then you end up having to be a jack of all trades just because that's just the way the world works sometimes. But at, there's, at, there hasn't been any kind of definitive, you know, hey, if you're coming in as this, um, I think Berto was networking at some point, and now he's basically doing all the same stuff. So it, jack of all trades seems to work. And then if you happen to have the staffing available to specialize individuals, then by all means, you know what I mean? It just put them in with what they're used to, you know? If I can, just I'll add on to that for a second. It depends on the shop. Um, if you saw the keynote yesterday morning, um, they talked about having to change processes and procedures. Um, companies coming in the cloud aren't changed, 
they're coming in the cloud thinking they're going to save some money, but they're just moving old stuff over to new stuff. They're not building out the new design. They're not training their people to do things a different way. Um, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a total change of your thinking, of your enterprise thinking. Uh, of, you know, we just can't rely on a single thing. Like Darren said, we need to use a load balancer. We need to put services behind the load balancer. If something falls over, there's other things to run it. So I think it's really, um, it's, it's a change of process and procedure for our companies. We have some that um, are very str stringent. They rely on single instances. They can't live without them. If they go down, our phones are ringing off the hook. Um, we have other companies that things fall over and they build a new one and they don't really care. Sir? Yeah, I have one question about the numbers. So how long will it take you to onboard a new customer to your private cloud and how long will it take you to deploy a typical uh, private cloud architecture and how many staffs will actively participate in the deployment? Uh, staff wise, I, mean, I don't know how many people would do it in the data center to get all everything cabled and racked and all that stuff. Uh, so I could, can't answer that. Uh, we have a deployment team of five people who will deploy the, the cloud on the, uh, on the hardware once it's up. It'll come to my team, or our team actually, uh, to do the QC and make sure that it's all set. We'll onboard the customer about a week. So it's starting from the uh, requirement or the, the, per the request uh, to the go live? I'm not on the deployment side. Okay. I would say it's probably, I think it's 30-ish days. So. So I guess it really depends. So we do um, Rackspace DC deployments and also customer uh, DC deployments. Typically what we say for, um, for deployment times if we have access is, you know, five days just, five days uh, deployment time just to cover all our bases, QC, ensure everything's up. Um, hardware, typically they say about 20 days um, and that's just for procurement, set up everything like that. And then we turn over the customer, and then from when we turn it over to when they're actually using it, you know, it, de it really depends on the customer, so. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Sweet. Say goodbye. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Thanks for coming out.